Live from Santa Clara, California, it's theCUBE. Covering Open Networking Summit 2017. Brought to you by the Linux Foundation. Um, so, you know, as you were saying, um, Open Daily, it really kind of kicked things off um, from a, a open source networking standpoint. I mean, there were certainly other open source controllers earlier um, in sort of the market life cycle, um, but they kind of never really made their way out of the universities. Um, open Daylight was the first that really um, had a lot of commercial participation and uptake kind of in the real world, so to speak. Um, so with that, I think there was a lot of learning um, that happened both on the, the vendor side um, with regard to open source as well as on the user side. Um, and as the Open Daylight platform um, you know, matured and started coming to fruition, we started seeing a lot of other projects sort of both below at the platform layer as well as further up the stack. Um, so at this point, and we've been talking about this quite a bit here at ONS, um, we've been talking a lot about sort of the, the whole open networking stack that has sort of come, come to fruition now. Um, that, that, you know, really low level stuff, DPDK was just announced uh, today, um, you know, uh, FIDO, which is uh, sort of big data for networking, um, and um, then all the way up the stack to, to ONAP, which was just announced last month. Um, ONAP is a bringing together of um, the Ecom project that was started by AT&T, and then they brought it to the Linux Foundation, and OpenO, which actually sort of germinated within the Linux Foundation with a lot of input from um, both some, a number of small vendors as well as major carriers, uh, particularly in Asia. Um, so uh, bringing those things together at the orchestration layer, um, and so now we've got this, this sort of whole stack. Some of it, a lot of it is Linux Foundation projects, some of it is other projects with, with other open source foundations, um, all of which we work with very collaboratively across all of those different projects. Right, right. Um, but at this point, we're really kind of looking at how do we um, enable people to consume this a little bit more easily. Um, from the user side, and then also from the developer side, right? There are a lot of developers who are involved in multiple different projects, um, which of course means that they're spread very thin across all those projects, and we're looking at how do we make it a more feasible and scalable um, activity for them. Right. So for example, um, you know, Open Daylight is upstream of a lot of other projects. There are a lot of um, other projects that have a lot of dependencies on Open Daylight. So how do we streamline the release train in such a way that that you know everybody gets what they need at the time that they need it, so they can do their releases on a timely basis and so forth and so on. Um, and that just you know that that makes things a lot easier from a developer standpoint. That also sort of naturally increases the improves the integration points between those projects, which is of course better for users. Right. Um, so those are a lot of the things that we have in motion sort of across the Linux Foundation. Um, um, to and, and I think that the other thing that we've really seen um, over the last year coming to fruition is a lot of the, the early adopters of Open Daylight in particular have now um, spent enough time working with the open source community um, either through their vendors or increasingly directly themselves that they kind of get this open source thing and they, they understand kind of what the processes are and, and why we do things the way they do. Right. And so they're willing to take a much more active role. Um, and so that's, that's a, you know, AT&T is a, a prime example of that, right? I mean, they, they were working on e-comp themselves internally and they very quickly became, came to the realization that in order to scale it as quickly as they needed to, I mean, they, they were putting you know, tens of thousands of their developers through, through specialized boot camps, right? right they're right. their networking people to become networking developers. Um, but at the, at the same point, you just can't push people through the system that fast enough, nor can you hire enough people that fast enough, and so that's why they decided to bring it to the open source community. It, it seems like there's a, kind of an acceleration of, of carving out some piece of what was proprietary and mm -hmm. putting it out to, to continue the development in, right. in an open source world. You know, a why you kind of answered the question just now in terms of you know you just not have enough people, but 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 more interestingly, you talked about you know some open source stuff just never gets going. What are some of the real secrets that make an open source project run yeah. versus those that don't or you know die on the vine? Yeah, um, it's there. Are a lot of different components, um, of course, like, in, when you, like with anything. Some of it is technical, right? Um, do you have the right architecture? Is it one that can scale? Is it, is, is it extensible? Um, are the right kinds of people involved in the project? You know, is the project being informed by the right kinds of people? So if you go and build something that nobody needs, 
um, either because you don't have the right people involved or because you're not open to that feedback, it's going to die on the vine. Um, so, you know, a, a successful project really has to have a strong community around it. Um, and it's a, it's a you know, chicken and chicken egg thing, egg, right? right? You know, how do you, how do you get a, a strong community? Well, you have the right processes in place, but you also make sure that you have the right people involved so that they can build the right kind of thing um, and that they have the skills to do it effectively. Right. And the other interesting trend that we're seeing is, is the Linux Foundation is becoming kind of the hub mm -hmm. where you put these things um, to grow. And as you said, really to cross-pollinate with the other open source projects that have all these interdependencies. Right. And that seems to be an accelerating trend as well, at least from the outside looking in. Yeah, no, it absolutely is. And um, you know, I think we learned a lot with, um, with Open Daylight and also with OpenStack. Um, you know, when OpenStack started, and OpenStack of course is even older than Open Daylight, but when OpenStack started, um, I think there was all kinds of euphoria in the industry because um, open source was relatively new to infrastructure and infrastructure people, um, you know, it was like, oh, I, I can build everything that I ever wanted to build right, now. Right. Um, and so there was this sort of um, uh, irrational exuberance about um, feature prol proliferation. Um, at, in, in some ways, a little bit kind of at the expense of platform stability initially. Um, and at a certain point, the users, again, started getting involved and said, that's great, we need the thing to actually work right, at right. scale in real world environments, right. please focus on that. And, and you know, that's the real, the real beauty and strength of open source is when you have users who care and see the possibility of a project, they can, they can be actively involved and actively influence where the focus of the project is going to be. Um, and that's where, how you get to something that's, that's going to be useful to people quickly. Mm -hmm. Well, it'd be great to hear a little bit more about how you, uh, when these, I'm always kind of mystified as an analyst or a journalist or whatever, when you see these things, the press release comes out, own app is the new thing, right? right? And there's a new thing like every week. How do you uh, ensure the success? How do you get the momentum behind it? I, I imagine there's a lot of stuff that's been happening behind the scenes for yeah. own app. Uh, we try not to keep it too behind the scenes. Yeah. Um, you know what we've what uh, you know has always been part of open source culture and is really a, has proven to be a best practice is openness and transparency of not just the code itself but the processes around it. Mm -hmm. um, if people feel like they understand what's going on, that things aren't being hidden from them. Um, that they have a, they can have a voice. Right. They're much more actively willing to participate. Right. Um, and so that's that's really kind of the key to, to building any kind of community. And, and how do you work with a big carrier like? I mean, the, the the fascinating part about this for me is like for the for our viewers who don't know what OwnApp and Onos and ODL are, it's basically all this carrier software that's becoming open source, and they're just putting it out there saying. It's no longer our family jewels, everybody can use it. I mean, that's, that's a big leap for an AT&T, you know. Um, tell us how you work with AT&T or Verizon or some of these big, mm -hmm. gigantic organizations. Like, um, they just hand you a, a thumb drive or like, <laughs> how, 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 do you get the, uh, how do you get the intellectual property? How does that process start? Um, you know, in the case of AT&T, they reached out to the Linux Foundation and, and said, you know, we, we want and need to do this help us do it, we don't, know, we don't know how this works, help us, teach us, um, you know, and, but it's, it's very much a, you know, I think a big part of the role of the Linux Foundation in all of this sort of project proliferation and so forth is, is teaching people how to do open source effectively. Um, because again, it's not just about throwing coders at a problem, because you can do that inside your own organization as well. It's, it's understanding, um, how to do that in a collaborative manner, how to carve off what, what parts to open source, because AT&T's Ecom platform, you know, not all of it has been open source. Some, some portion of it, the, the stuff that's really you know, important and proprietary and is the sort of the, the crown jewels, that has that stayed internal, but they've shared a you know, reasonable, fairly large percentage of the, the base platform with the open source community. And you know, learning to draw that line is, is an art. Um, and figuring out you know, what is commodity and really could and should be shared with the rest of the world so that we're not all reinventing the same wheel, right. but all, you know, rather than having 10 developers here doing that and 10 developers here and da 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 da, we can put 30 developers all working together to get the same thing more quickly. 
Um, and you know, sort of, you know, that t that that shift in mindset can take a little bit of time and a bit of education, and that's kind of part part of what the Linux Foundation brings to that process of of onboarding um, new open source projects as right. well. And then on the other end, I always think of Randy Bias. You know, he's one of our favorite guests, especially with OpenStack. And you know, it was a couple of OpenStack Silicon Valley's ago where, you know, he was he was somewhat critical on the other end, saying, you know, we also have to kind of rein things in, and you you know, you have all this risks of stuff going all over the place. And mm -hmm. how do you kind of have some organization at the top end because of right. successful growth can drive a bunch of different agendas and things yeah. can get forked. So, yeah. you know, it's not a it's not a simple thing to manage. Yeah, and, and you know, we've we've tried different models um, and different approaches within within different projects, and we've learned a lot from that. I mean, um, you know, Open Daylight um, was very much a you know you guys figure it out hands off kind of model. Um, you know, other open source projects have been very top down. Um, you know, from their governance structure to everything else. Um, Others like OpenO were kind of in between where they, they did specifically set up an architecture committee um, that was composed of you know, sort of the leading members of the project um, because again, OpenO in particular is touching the business layer of these carriers. Um, and so they, they really need that architecture to be meeting their specifications. Right, right. Um, you know, it, 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 it's sort of at lower layers that's sort of a little bit less critical. Um, and so there, there are lots of different models and sort of a, a gradation of you know, top down versus bottom up and you know, let a thousand flowers bloom. <laughs> um, and there are pluses and minuses to, to all of right. them. I think that we, right. we've been sort of learning as we go through all these different projects of what works. Um, and different, sometimes it's, it's worth shifting the model, You're starting out one way and shifting as, as you go along as the project matures right. too. But the net net, which I think you said at the beginning, is that big companies uh, are, are, are now really learning how to operate effectively in this world, in this, this open source paradigm. Yeah. Uh, it's matured way, way, way beyond what we used to always joke years ago as a free puppy, you know? Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and, and you know, I mean, I think telcos understand now that it, it right. is, yes, it's a free puppy, you, have, you still have to do lots of work. Um, <laughs> I think that 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 um, understanding is sort of starting to trickle into the enterprise. Um, I still have, you know, every time I, I do a briefing, people will ask me to tell me tell them about my product, and I say I don't have a product. I I can't sell you anything. Um, you know, I help I help you know bring together a bunch of building blocks that you and your vendors can put together. Right. But I don't have a product, and that's you know that's a, a major mind shift for especially enterprise IT where they're used to buying things off the shelf. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so larger enterprises um, are starting again. Um, they tend to take their cues from the carriers um, as things get proven out in the carrier world, um, and so we're starting to see that that those same. Um, level of understanding and also um, drivers in large, especially very distributed types of organizations where they have you know, 50, 100, mo hundreds of different sites around the world that they need to have you know, a centralized view of in some fashion. Um, and you know, the only way they can get there is with SDN and they have a very strong preference, a very clear preference for open source. How big is the Linux Foundation now? By what metric? Uh, people, I guess. <laughs> oh, people. Um, we're a few hundred, no more. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's it's not just we're not the ones doing all the work, right? Yeah. We're we right. organize things, we help things happen, we we help teach people, it we provide to be the growing infrastructure. Very fast, like uh, new projects are being added and but, merged. But again, it's 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 vendors and it's very users. grassroots. Yeah. yeah. It's uh, we we help you know provide the the ground mm -hmm. the you know, the legal framework and the the technical you know, test facilities and things like that and, and kind of the organizational guide rails. Um, but that's, you know, we're here to help. We're not the ones doing the work. Right, mm -hmm. right. All right, Lisa, so I'll give you the last word before we uh, before we, we sign off here. As you look forward to 2017, what are some of your kind of top priorities for this next year? Yeah, so um, several things. Uh, first order is um, really um, enabling our users 
um, to really be successful with the projects that they already have in hand. And in, in many cases, they're um, well through the, the, the phase of proof, proof of concept and all the way onto production. And we just want to make sure that they're continuing to get everything they want out of the, the project um, and supporting them and supporting their vendors. Um, and really building out the commercial ecosystem around it so that they have a strong base of support. Um, so that's one thing, certainly on the open daylight side with some of the newer projects, um, it's really about you know, figuring out what are the best practices that we can implement for, for this project, for this project, for this project, in order to make sure that they're successful. And a lot of that, again, is that whole harmonization effort that we have right, going on. Right. All right, Lisa Kaywood, she knows all about bringing open uh, source to the enterprise, and uh, thanks for taking a few minutes out of your day. Thank you, thank you very much for having me. Nice. Absolutely. I'm Jeff Frick, he's Scott Rainovich. You're watching theCUBE from Open Networking Summit 2017 in Santa Clara, California. We'll be back after the short break. Thanks for watching. Oh.